You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. How familiar are you with the world-famous ballet Giselle? In the broadest strokes, it's the tragic love story of Giselle, a young peasant girl, who falls in love with a disguised suitor who is later revealed to have been engaged to Princess Bathilde all along. My guest this week is award-winning, best-selling author Margaret Porter. Her book, The Limits of Limelight, was a finalist for the Chanticleer International Book Awards, and her novel Beautiful Invention, a novel of Hedy Lamarr, was named a Top 12 Golden Age Hollywood Historical Novel by Bustle, it was a finalist for the Independent Publishers of New England Award for Fiction, and winner of the NH Literary Award for Outstanding Work of Fiction. Margaret's 15th book, The Myrtle Wand, is a reimagined continuation of the aforementioned ballet Giselle, set in 17th century France and the court of Louis XIV. Margaret's writing is lush and vivid and weaves together characters, both historic and fictional, into a compelling tale of love, heartbreak, friendship, piety, royalty, and the supernatural. Margaret has also generously offered to give away an autographed copy of The Myrtle Wand to one lucky listener. You can enter in three easy steps. One, go to the Paris Underground Radio website and sign up for our newsletter. Two, like the Paris Underground Radio Instagram page. And three, tag a friend who may also be interested in winning. All right, enough of that. Let's get to the good part. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce Margaret Porter, author of The Myrtle Wand. Hello, Margaret. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello to you, Jennifer, and thanks so much for having me on. (laughs) Can we start with you telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Certainly. I am Margaret Porter, and I am an author of 15 historical novels. I began my writing career as a more in the romance genre, writing historical romances set in the Jane Austen era, the uh, Regency era romances, and then grew into writing more romantic historical novels, similar to what Julia Quinn and, and Bridgerton books were like. We were at the same publisher during that phase of my career. And then I decided to go to my very first and greatest love, which is mainstream historical fiction and especially biographical historical fiction, which some of my books have been. I was I started my artistic endeavors as, as an actress. I was on this adult stage from my childhood and performed all through college up to graduate school and worked also, I have a master's degree in radio, television, film. I taught television studio production, did some producing of informational and instructional films, I was an extra in feature films, have done some feature film script writing, short films. So previously I was involved with working with casts of dozens or crews of dozens and then morphed into being a single person sitting in a room by myself with people talking in my head, (laughs) listening to my characters and writing down what they say and coming up with historical plots. That's quite a change. It is, but the background in the theater and plays and costume wearing and all of that has been so informative and helpful in in a career as a writer. The character of study, the ability to write dialogue, and then the film work is so visual because when you're writing a screenplay type of thing, you're thinking so visually. So they they really marry well together with, with the career as a historical novelist. 
Yeah, and your latest book, The Myrtle Wand, it's very visually rich. Can you tell us a little bit about the story, the plot of The Myrtle Wand? Yes, it is inspired by the ballet Giselle, which is a favorite ballet of mine. And I saw a production of it that was based upon the original libretto. So the characters and the plot were as they were originally conceived in the original premiere 1841 Paris production. And the character of Princess Bathilde was so different to what the modern versions of Giselle portray her as, in which she's very she's very aristocratic, but very condescending. She makes friendly overtures to Giselle at first, and then there's a point at which it shifts and she becomes very angry and sort of stomps off. And uh, But in the original, she was actually quite devastated by Giselle's fate and what happens. She was genuinely friendly towards Giselle. And I was just so enraptured by this version of the ballet. And so I did a lot of study of, of what the original ballet had been like, and especially the concluding scene, which is very different from the way it's normally portrayed on stage nowadays. And I got to thinking about it and and asking myself, what happened with these people before the curtain came up? And what happened to these people, the ones that remained alive, after the curtain fell? What were their lives like? And all these questions just, just sparked an interest. And so I decided that I would write the backstory of Giselle and Batilde and Myrta, the, who is the, the queen of the wheelies, the ghostly girls who've been betrayed by their lovers. And also the, the duke who is involved with both Giselle and Princess Batilde. So that's how the story came about. And that's essentially what it's about. And I'll offer no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Um, we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But before we do, do you have a personal connection to Paris or to France? I do. I have several types of personal connection. My ancestors came, some of my ancestors came from La Rochelle and from Poitiers area in the uh, poitou charente what is now the poitou charente region. And I have visited various parts of France, Normandy mostly, and then the the Ducev region of poitou charente La Rochelle. And then also, I have members of my family who have lived in France, studied in France, and taught in France. And Paris, I have visited uh, with my husband. And also, well, the first time I went to Paris, he had, he had been there previously, and so he showed me around. I walked blisters on my feet. It was, you know, that first visit to Paris. It's like, I have to see everything. Show me everything. So we did. Saw everything, and it was it was quite wonderful. But then over the years later, he had professional reasons for work reasons to be in Paris. And so we would do things together. We would meet friends over there. But also when he was busy in in the daytime doing work-related things, he was a consultant for radio stations and would attend conferences or do presentations. And I was able to do Paris on my own, which was so, that's a wonderful way to sort of learn your way around, to become more familiar with the city and to hunt out the places that for me, the most historical areas of Paris, it has, my books are primarily set in 17th and 18th century, not counting the Hollywood books that I've written. And Paris was so transformed in the 19th century that you really have to look to find, mostly it's the sacred places, uh, the churches, and some of the Hotel Particulier, which were the mansions of the nobility, a few of them have survived, some have been turned into museums, but you know, that kind of wandering Paris, looking for the, the really, really old stuff was was quite fun for me. You're talking about it makes me want to visit, but I I live here. <laughs> but you're, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you're so inspiring. <laughs> well, living there makes me want to return. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they get you. <laughs> that's right. So that actually leads me to my first question, which is, this is the second time I think that you visited the 17th century, but the first time in France? It is, yes. What is it that draws you to this time period? Some of my study in the UK as an undergraduate was in 17th century history. At that time, I had no idea I was going to become a novelist. But (laughs) after spending so much time in the Jane Austen era, I became transfixed by a particular 
couple, King Charles II and his mistress, Nell Gwen, who was an actress, had an illegitimate son. And then he married a young woman who was a court beauty at the court of Charles II, King James, and then William and Mary. She was a, a maid of honor to Queen Mary II. And I had a genealogical connection to her. So I decided to research that book and write their their story, which I did. So that was my first 17th century novel. And then when it came to doing The Myrtle Wand, I was doing the whole Giselle reinterpretation, reimagining and continuation. And But I needed a setting. And I didn't, I wasn't keen to to set it in Paris of 1841 when the ballet was originally premiered. And I was thinking about where, what, what would I, where would I place it? And I had wanted to do, after doing two Hollywood books, I really wanted to return to the 17th century. And so I thought, okay, 17th century, where and when? And well, the creators of Giselle were Frenchmen, Victor Hugo and Théophile Gautier. And I thought, well, it has to be set in France. So then I thought, well, what about the court of Louis XIV? Because he was, a, he was one of the creators of the form that is ballet as we know it, he, the court ballets and court masks of, of his royal court. I decided that I would set it at a much earlier time in his reign when he was still a young man under his mother's regency and then as he was sort of coming into his own, which is a, a bit less well-known than the Versailles period of, of his reign. And then that's sort of, it just all it just kind of all fit together really well for me. And then the parts, the rural parts of the story, I set in the area that I knew best, which was around Poitiers, New York, in what is now poitou Charente. So it was a, it was a nice combination of a time, a place, a history, uh, a king, and then a story that I sort of did a mashup of. (laughs) That makes sense. So if the story is inspired by the ballet Giselle, why did you decide to focus on Princess Bathilde as the main character and not Giselle? Well, because it's tragic. Yeah. (laughs) I like to be able to write stories that, though there may be conflict and tragedy and great sorrow and loss in them, I want to be able to have an uplifting message. And I I want my main characters to be the ones that prevail and have a satisfying conclusion. And because I was so intrigued with the original concept of Princess Bathilde as quite a generous, kind-hearted person, and also one who, depending how much people do or don't know about the ballet, one who survives and is still around in the very first version of the ballet, she's still around at the end. She makes an appearance at the end of the ballet, which is was revolutionary to me because I had no idea. And sort of that was then what happens to her and the Duke when the curtain comes down and there's this indication of a reconciliation. So those had to be my main characters. But then I also wanted to introduce a character who could be another point of view character who was not, number one, not female, and number two, not the Duke, because I'd like there to be some uncertainty about who he is, why he does what he does, what his motivations are, what his intentions are. So I chose his manservant, Wilfred who in the ballet is the one person that knows everything that's happening. He knows who the Duke is engaged to. He knows that the Duke becomes somewhat infatuated with Giselle. He knows that the princess is is nearby and likely to find out about this. And he keeps trying to warn the Duke to, you know, be careful and don't do this. And I, and I thought, well, this is a character that is sort of a kind of almost a Greek chorus character because they know what's going on. They, they filter lots of lots of the action and the characters through their perception. So that's the other primary character. Curious about what's going on in Paris right now? My second podcast, Don't Miss This, takes you beyond the typical and the obvious with a weekly roundup of the best of what's happening in Paris each week. Never wonder what you're missing out on again. Listen now to Don't Miss This on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. So we start the story with three young girls, three central characters in this convent. And two of them, Myrthe and Bathilde, are inspired by the ballet. 
And Francoise is inspired by a real person. That's correct. <laughs> so how did you decide how to interweave these real life people with the fictional ones? That's a wonderful question. And, and Francoise was a gift that just dropped in my lap once I decided to have that story set in that region of France, in New York. And I was doing some research on people who had lived within that that time. And I remembered that she had been, she'd had a really interesting early life, but she had ended up, Francoise Dominique, had ended up in a convent in New York as a, as a pupil, but did not remain there. But it was all about the effort to, she had been raised by a um, Huguenot family who were Calvinist Protestants in France in the 17th century, but her mother and, and guardians were Roman Catholic, and there was this strong effort to convert her back to Catholicism. So they kept pitching her into different convents to try to bring about this, this conversion. And hers, her first convent experience was in New York, and I had already decided to set the chateau of Princess Bathilde in very close by to there. And I thought, okay, this, this will bring in more of that historically based, fact-based fiction that I so love and marry it with my imaginary story. And then, of course, Francoise was, was also somewhat of an entry point into the court of Louis, well, into Paris, because after she left the convent, she was in Paris. So, so she was able to reenter the story in that part of it. And then after the conclusion of the book, many, many years later, she becomes a wife, the second wife of King Louis XIV, unacknowledged, but she had been governess to his children. And then ultimately, kind of, she converted him, having herself become a devout Catholic and, and warned him away from all of his mistresses. And, and she was governess to his illegitimate children. And he was quite cowed by her <laughs> at first. And then they managed to build a sort of a, a marriage, which, so that was, that was sort of closing the circle, although that, that aspect of King Louis's life and Francoise's life takes place much later. So it was fun. Francoise was, was an interesting character because she, she's a little bit prickly. She's a little bit socially ambitious. And to know that ultimately she ended up married to a king is quite, I think, quite, quite rich. <laughs> yeah, she's very interesting. I loved seeing Louis as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, we don't get to see him or read about him that much. We hear about him when he's the king at Versailles and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about the research that you did in terms of the actual people and the real places? And were you able to visit any of these places that are still standing? Well, I have been to, to some, but not all of the places. The wedding of, of King Louis and his first cousin, double first cousin, uh, the Infanta of Spain, Marie Therese, that took place down in the very far south of France on the border of Spain, which I have not visited. So obviously that kind of research was done through reading descriptions of the wedding and the travels to, to reach the wedding and the treaty that was being written between France and Spain at that time. And then the sort of research that you do just to what's the geography, what's the town like, what is the church like that they were married in, that sort of thing. For Francoise and for Louis, reading biographies of theirs and reading the, the memoirs, it was very literary. The women of the 17th century in France of the court were quite literary. And they wrote their memoirs, their letters would be collected. So it was, there was a lot of, primary source material, the, that bird's eye view, that first person experience of the court of, of Louis XIV, of the, the experience of the rebellions that were taking place during his earlier years, all of the politics and the, the military aspects of it, which are somewhat foundational. I don't go into a great detail about that. I try to stay focused on the characters and their relationships, but that whole atmosphere of conflict and turmoil and a very, very young king who is being manipulated, I guess, but not even because he really had very little power. His mother was ruling the roost. The cardinal, her chief advisor, was essentially the ruler of France. And then once the cardinal dies and once Louis is married and his mother becomes somewhat sidelined, he begins to have this sense of his own, his own potential 
He had not been extremely well educated to become a king. I think he was aware of some of his deficiencies. He was he grew and grew to become more ambitious. And ultimately, it led to his desire to conquer all of Europe <laughs> and wage war constantly throughout Europe, and then also to sort of capture the nobility and force them to be his his underlings and his court at Versailles, which is a, that part of whether it's the television show or other histories or biographies of Louis, it really focuses more on that later part of his reign. And as I said earlier, I, I find that his youth and his relationship with his brother Philippe as well, who was quite probably one of the most flamboyant and fascinating characters of, of that whole era. And that was also interesting to do because people had so many interesting comments to make about the king's brother and his his what he was like at court and his flamboyance, shall we say. Yeah, his life probably would have been much different if he wasn't the king's brother. Correct. He got away with, he was able to do whatever he wished to do within the confines of the court. I think in so many ways, he had so much more freedom than than his brother, the king. Yeah. So I was familiar with the story of Vaux-le-Vicomte and how the Versailles Palace came to be and the conflict between Nicolas Fouquet and Louis XIV. But I have never read such a vivid description of the opening party. I've never gotten to feel like I was there before. Was that, how much of that was historically accurate and how much of that was uh, stuff that you embellished? Well, the presence of my own main character, Princess Batilde, obviously that's fictional. (laughs) Right. I was not able to 100% confirm that Francoise Scarrel, as she was then, was present, but she was a confidant and very close friend of Madame Fouquet. So it is possible and that she was there. I wasn't able to rule it in. I wasn't able to rule it out. And when you're a fiction writer, you have a license to use your imagination and make things up. So I placed her there only very briefly, but it, it made sense to me. I needed to sort of bring her back in the story at some point, and that worked out perfectly. That is sometimes called the most famous party in the world. And the consequences of that party were quite great because that fostered the king's desire to prove that he was the most important person in the kingdom, though he was not the richest, as Nicolas Fouquet was. That party was just, there are so many histories written about the party. <laughs> there was so much more I could have put in about every single dish that was served and, and the golden plates that, you know, each hierarchy of the guest, the royals ate on gold and the nobility ate on silver and then the other people ate on pewter or something else. And the dishes were described in great, great detail. The, the chef was quite famous. He ultimately met his doom by serving something that was unacceptable, but not at this party. <laughs> that was at a later time. And the creation of that chateau was so, the purpose of it was to display great wealth, great taste, great sensibility, and great ambition. And it was what brought down the person who had, who had created it for all those purposes, which is so ironic and contrary to the way it was supposed to be. You know, I think Louis XIV might not have been who he turned out to be had it not been for that particular event and his realization that his finance minister was cooking the books, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, it it seems like a dumb move in retrospect to throw such a lavish party for the guy you're stealing from, but that's that's a different book. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, another person who was real, who was in the story is Louise de la Valliere, who was Louis' first kind of acknowledged mistress. She, he did not acknowledge her until his, his mother passed away, but she was his one of his early great loves. And she was present at the party and there were descriptions of exactly what she wore. So I was able to indicate what she wore. That's another part of writing these kinds of books set in this kind of time where the clothing is so lavish and so particular to that to that era. And you do all the research of it and you but you can't you're not just describing Fashion Week at <laughs> at Le Vicomte, you know, and you've got to to remember to move the plot along. So it's as you do all this research on what were they wearing, what were they eating, which room were they dancing in, and all of these things. And then this, you don't want it to be too much. You can't overload the the story with all of that because it it becomes distracting. So you only have to choose those things that will reinforce 
a character choice or a char- something about a character or the plot, the conflict. It does feel very lush, though, in reading it. Well, good. That's, that's good to hear. <laughs> I'm so glad. It makes sense to me that you say that you started as a romance writer and then historical romance, because each of these three young girls that we start with, Bathilde and Myrthe and Françoise, they go on to have very different kinds of love stories. And their love stories are very integral to who they are and what happens to them. And of course, that's part of what it was like just being a woman at the time. But they end up going down three very different paths with three very different endings. And it really brings to life what it was like to be a woman at that time, or at least a woman of means. Can you talk a little bit about how you crafted these characters? Certainly. Well, the ballet Giselle in the second act, it's known as a ballet blanche. And it's a, it's a white ballet. It's ghosts, ghost girls dancing and trying to find men and wreaking vengeance upon them by making them dance to death as vengeance upon all their betrayers. And the queen, their queen, is Myrta in the ballet. And I was really curious to know what happened to her to make her (laughs) so vengeful. What was her story of betrayal? And what sort of a person was she? And she had to be a strong person, a very determined person, but she had to have suffered greatly. I made her a rich, nouveau rich type of person. Princess Bathilde was of the noblesse ancienne. So she was of the highest aristocracy. And then Giselle was a villager, a peasant girl her, who worked in the, the grape vineyard. There were those three strata, which as a someone who loves an avid researcher, it was I, I was able to study the lives of women of each of those types and young women, and what their opportunities were and what their limitations were. For a young woman, this startled me to know that if she remained unwed, she was not liberated or did not reach her majority until the age of 25, which seems quite late (laughs) for, for a person to be under the thumb or under the rule of their parent or guardian, as King Louis ultimately becomes to Princess Bathilde. And so whatever visions of life you might have for yourself, they've already been formed by your aristocratic parents or your rich merchant father or your mother in the village who expects that you're going to marry the gamekeeper because you've grown up together. And those each of those stories comes to a, a quite different conclusion. For Giselle, having lived in the village all of her life with the expectation that she'll marry the boy next door, more or less, and uh, a handsome, uh, suave stranger comes into the village, and it is easy to understand why she is so becomes almost immediately infatuated and quite hopeful that his attentions to her would be genuine and that she would having grown up so close to Princess Bathilde and the Chateau and having known Myrt and the uh, sort of, she romanticizes the life that is not her own. You talked a little bit about your personal connection to this story, but as I was reading it, I wonder, there are so many beautiful, lush, detailed descriptions of flowers and their meanings. Are you a a gardener? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm definitely a gardener. I have been all my life. My grandfather on my dad's side had a very famous rose garden. My own mother was a very uh, avid and gifted rose gardener and was particularly interested in heritage roses and also in herbs. And so I, I got it from both sides, I guess you might say. My garden is, my current garden has 185 rose bushes. Wow. Many of which are heritage varieties and some of which were grown in the 17th century. And one of which, the autumn damask or uh, quatre saisons, is mentioned a few times in the story because it is a rose that historically, it might go even back to the Roman times or the times of Christ. They don't even know how old this rose is, but it was one of the few, if not the only roses, that had a period of bloom throughout the year. In the past, the roses would bloom at the 
height of early summer to midsummer, but then they did, there was no reblooming capacity on most roses. And this was rare and treasured because it would, it would bloom at several points within the year. The my my catch for saison will not bloom in winter. <laughs> I get three seasons <laughs> out of it usually. So perhaps in France or Italy or wherever it must have uh, Rome or wherever it originated, it, it might have gone into a fourth season for sure. But it the name it retains the name, and then the qualities of of myrtle the herb is. It was traditionally carried by brides at weddings for, for centuries. It probably is some kind of a, a pagan ritual, but it continues to this day. And in, in the British royal family, the brides of the royal family all carry a sprig of myrtle in their wedding bouquet, which is a descendant of the sprig of myrtle that Queen Victoria carried in hers. So it's one of those bridal traditions and it's also within the ballet, in the original libretto, it is mentioned that Myrt is waving about a, a myrtle wand as she raises up the ghostly girls from their graves, and in particular, Giselle from, from hers when she makes her debut as one of the ghosts in Act Two of the ballet. So that was, that in particular is very, very symbolic. But the seasons, the change of seasons, the charting, the the progress within within the vineyard, the grapes, um, the culture of grape growing, which is important throughout France and Europe, but France in particular. And then, of course, the, <laughs> that required some study into the particular culture of grape growing within the region that I had set the story in. So I was, you know, the fun kind of research is the really immersive sort of research where you're going to the wine shop and buying Charente wine and saying, this is, this is for research. <laughs> this is what my characters would have been drinking and making. I love that. I'm so glad I asked. Thank you for that. Does French culture sometimes leave you scratching your head? Well, you might enjoy listening to our sister podcast, Navigating the French, hosted by journalist Emily Monaco. Each episode focuses on a different word in the French language, and Emily is joined by an expert who will help explore what that word says about French culture. Listen now to Navigating the French on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. So I think now is probably a good time for us to listen to a reading from the book. Is there anything that we need to know contextually before we do? This takes place at, on the estate where Princess Batilde's chateau is, and her friend Mert is extremely unwell, and it is the time of the harvesting of the grapes, which in the ballet and a few times within the story, there's a great celebration when the last load of the fruit is brought into the village, and there's a big you know, there's dancing and music and party and drinking and festival atmosphere. And so she is going from a sick room into that atmosphere. To prevent Mirt from sinking deeper into depression, Batilde asked, Shall I play for you? Not now. My head aches. Because you haven't eaten. Why not try one of the cordials Sophie prepared to ease your cough? She distilled this one from myrtle leaves. And here's juice of cherries stirred into brandy. Perhaps you should have both. Myrt took a few sips of each liquid before returning the glass. You're dressed for an outing. It's the last day of the grape harvest. I'm riding to the village, but I'll not stay long. I promise. She reached down to smooth her friend's cheek. The skin was nearly as colorless as the bedsheet, and so wasted that the bones underneath protruded. Myrt's black hair streamed over the pillow, dull and tangled. When Bathilde returned, she would ask if she might comb it. Pierre Jusson, the grandson of her maitre d'hôtel, whose family members filled several household positions, served as her personal page. She found him with Lune, already saddled, waiting in the stable yard. The hounds in the kennel, aware of activity, responded with a chorus of barks. Shall I follow, princess? That won't be necessary. She craved solitude. Guiding her mount along the woodland path, she recalled Myrt's conviction 
that she'd heard the Veli whispering to her. During their convent years, they often had joked about Amelie's superstitious belief in the spectral creatures who supposedly roamed in the night, vengefully pursuing any male unfortunate enough to encounter them. From childhood they had been taught that the soul lived on beyond death and were told of the miracles performed by the saints. If those teachings were indeed true, wasn't it just as plausible that unquiet spirits might rise from the earth at midnight and descend into it as daylight appeared? Or, she wondered, eyeing the squared steeple of the parish church and the graveyard, did she commit sin by considering the possibility? Pascal's cart, laden with the last load of fruit, arrived from the vineyard, escorted by grape-gatherers. The forester's son, Hilaire, impersonating the wine-god Bacchus, was mounted on the donkey. His loose linen tunic hung low over his breeches, and his shaggy head was bound with yellowing grape-leaves. As his neighbors cheered, he hoisted a tankard and drank from it. Pascal approached a pretty young woman, the innkeeper's daughter, and crowned her with a wreath of vines and flowers and rye stalks, designating her harvest queen. Barrels of pinot were rolled from her father's tavern into the street, and the people lined up to fill their cups with the potent liquid. The fiddler struck up a tune, and Hilaire sought Giselle as his partner. Surrounded by their friends, they capered about, hands on hips as they hopped from one foot to the other, linking arms as they skipped together, then formed a circle with the other young people. Their dance was entirely different than the ones Batilde had learned. They moved so joyfully, with dizzying speed, unhampered by their lightweight garments. Watching, she envied them and wished she could join in their fun, but she was unfamiliar with the simple steps and knew that none of those lively young men would approach and take her hand. Her status was too far above theirs, and she regarded them across a great chasm carved by centuries of feudalism. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. What's next for you? Do you have another book in the works? I do. And I actually have a couple of books in the works. <laughs> I have the one that I'm just beginning is still 17th century. It was so fun to be back. And this one is set at the court of Charles II after the Restoration and uh, in England. And it's it's also inspired by another art form, but it's so early. I'm not really being public about it. Mm -hmm. And then the other book that I'm that I have had begun writing and have completely researched in England is a biographical historical novel about uh, a real dancer of the 18th century and a famous actor of the 18th century, and they were kind of theatrical royalty, I guess you might say, of throughout the 18th century. And that's been one of those that carries me deeply back into the theatrical world, which is fun for me. And uh, so those are the two. And then I have a contemporary novel, which is about maybe three quarters finished that I wrote. I started a long time ago. And, and that's sort of one of those aspirations that's not yet fulfilled is to finish and write and have published a contemporary novel just because I want to see how, how that turns out for me. So that will come after these two projects probably, or on a day when I'm feeling kind of blocked and not, not really ready to, or, or inspired to write on one of the other two, I've got something completely different to, that I can, that I can turn to if I need to and, and finish that one up. Never short of something to be writing. That makes me really curious. So when you write, you write multiple books at the same time? I don't, don't exactly the composition part, not really. But when I do come to a point that I feel like it's time, like it's a stopping point or my subconscious needs to work something out, I will sometimes turn to researching one of the books in the future or thinking about a scene or uh, making notes about something so that there's always an activity. But I, I tend to focus primarily on a single project, but I always know what's in the wings, what's what's next. And, and my brain will sometimes just lock on to that and a scene will come into my mind and I have to capture it. So I'm kind of flexible and kind of disciplined all at the same time. 
That's amazing. I I understand. Sometimes you need a bit of perspective or it just needs to gestate and exactly. Yeah. Fabulous. So where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with what you're doing and all of your books that are coming? Well, my website is quite easy. It's margaretporter.com. And there are links to all my social channels on that website. And I also have a blog, which I update from time to time with historical things related to my books or events or activities that are upcoming or post links to interviews that have already happened. And I'm on Instagram as author Margaret Porter. And then I'm on Twitter as Margaret Porter. And I'm on Facebook as I think it's Margaret Porter author, but the website (laughs) will will take you wherever you, you need to go. I try to stay active on social media. I have, I have preferred channels and preferred modes of communication. But the thing about social media is it's a promotional tool, but it's also a networking tool and a connection tool with readers and with other writers. And instead of just focusing on the books, particularly on Instagram, there are a lot of pictures of roses and my dog who's in the in this novel and my life visually. So so I try to be restrained about the buy my book, buy my book part of it, because it's, it's more creative to me to, to share my life with people and to absorb what their lives are as well. Yeah. And it's nicer for us as the readers to get a glimpse by, at the person who's creating all of these worlds. I feel the same as a reader. <laughs> it's the same for me. Well, I'll include links to everything so that people can find you really easily. And I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This was wonderful. I feel like I could just keep talking to you forever. I feel the same. It's great to know that you're over there in Paris. And uh, next time I'm there, I will look you up. Absolutely. Please do. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Huge thanks again to Margaret Porter for her flexibility, generosity, and for such a fascinating conversation. You can find Margaret on her website at margaretporter.com on Instagram at author Margaret Porter, on Facebook at author Margaret Porter, and on Twitter at Margaret Porter. Don't forget, you can win an autographed copy of the fabulous The Myrtle Wand. Just go to the Paris Underground Radio website and sign up for our newsletter, like the Paris Underground Radio Instagram page, and tag a friend who may also be interested in winning. Get additional entries for additional friends. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with author Carrie Mayer about her book, The Paris Bookseller. Check back to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Join our book club. The Storytime Book Club welcomes authors who have been featured on this podcast to come talk more in depth about their books. Since we keep the podcast spoiler free, this is the perfect chance to get all your specific questions answered. For more information, including sign up, please join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening. And until next time, happy reading. This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.